It has to be honest. The current plan to return to the moon is far from ideal. It's slow, plagued by delays and minor technical issues, and relies on an incredibly expensive launch system. To NASA's credit, they aren't pretending everything is perfect. They fully acknowledge these challenges and are actively exploring alternatives to address them. Interestingly, one such alternative involves SpaceX's Starship to carry out a pretty wild duty. On a podcast hosted by NASA public relations official Gary Jordan, Interim Administrator Sean Duffy addressed concerns about the Artemis program, highlighting what worries him most. He said, we could talk about what it means economically, which is all very real. Here is my one concern. If Artemis 1, Artemis 2, and Artemis 3 are all $4 billion a launch, um, at $4 billion a launch, you don't have a moon program. Mm. It just, I don't think that exists. Um, we have to bring the price down. And so I have to think about and work with members of Congress, what does Artemis 4, 5, and 6 look like? But to spend that much money... Um, and thinking about what we have to do to have a sustained presence, I think becomes very, very challenging. And so what, what is the answer? Duffy has been clear in his position. The Space Launch System, SLS, is unaffordable, and any lunar program built around it is likely unsustainable beyond a few symbolic flags and footprints missions. Instead, he advocates for leveraging commercial alternatives currently being developed by companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. However, on July 4th, President Trump signed the One Big Beautiful Bill into law. A key amendment introduced by Senator Ted Cruz added approximately $9.9 .9 billion in additional funding to support Artemis, the SLS rocket, and the Orion spacecraft, effectively ensuring that Artemis 4 and Artemis 5 would continue to launch on the SLS platform. So how does NASA plan to save money while still using this costly rocket? The answer is simple. Just try to make the SLS more affordable. The House version of NASA's fiscal year 2026 appropriations bill includes a notable directive. The committee directs NASA to evaluate alternatives to the current exploration upper stage EUS design for SLS, with a focus on reducing development and production costs, shortening the schedule, and maintaining the required lift capability of at least 130 tons to low Earth orbit. NASA should also evaluate how alternative designs could support the long-term evolution of SLS and broader exploration goals beyond low Earth orbit. NASA is directed to assess various propulsion systems, stage configurations, infrastructure compatibility, commercial and international collaboration opportunities, and the cost and schedule impacts of each alternative. This plan shall outline how NASA intends to utilize the remaining flight-proven components of SLS for human and cargo missions in support of lunar and Mars mission activities. NASA is directed to report to the committee on its findings no later than 180 days after the enactment of this act. The Exploration Upper Stage is a new rocket stage currently under development for future missions using NASA's Space Launch System. Designed for the Block 1B and Block 2 configurations, it will eventually replace the interim cryogenic propulsion stage used on the initial Block 1 variant. The EUS will be powered by four RL-10C-3 engines, fueled by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, producing a combined thrust of 433.1 kilonewtons. Its purpose is to significantly increase the SLS's translunar injection capability beyond what Block 1 can achieve. The first planned flight of the EUS is Artemis IV, scheduled for 2028. However, the EUS has become a costly and delayed component of the program. According to NASA's Office of Inspector General, the stage's development cost has surged from an initial estimate of $962 million to $2.8 billion, while the timeline has slipped by more than six years. Canceling or replacing the EUS could, in theory, save NASA a significant amount of money. Yet, going back to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage isn't a viable option either. So, what options does NASA have? One proposed alternative is to use a commercially developed upper stage that already utilizes the same hydrogen-oxygen propellants and falls within a similar size class. Blue Origin's New Glenn upper stage. 
Powered by two vacuum-optimized BE3U engines, the new Glenn second stage, designated GS2, is designed and built by Blue Origin to operate with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, similar to the EUS. In theory, integrating it with the SLS would only require a structural adapter to connect the stage to the SLS core and interface it with the payload. However, NASA has raised several concerns with this approach. One major issue is physical. The combined height of the SLS core stage and Blue Origin's upper stage would exceed the maximum clearance of the Vertical Assembly Building VAB doors at Kennedy Space Center. Accommodating this configuration would require costly and time-consuming modifications to the VAB's structure. Additionally, NASA has noted that the BE-3U engines generate higher thrust than the RL-10S originally planned for the EUS. This would lead to increased end-of-life acceleration for the Orion spacecraft, potentially stressing its structure and requiring a redesign of its solar arrays to withstand the added forces. Another option that has been suggested is to use the Centaur 5 upper stage, which features similar technology. Of course, modifications would also need to be made to the core stage of the SLS rocket and its launch tower to accommodate the Centaur 5. This solution doesn't solve all of NASA's challenges with the Artemis program, but at least it makes the journey to the moon a bit less difficult this time around. Unlike during the Apollo era, when NASA received about 5% of the national budget, today's funding is far more limited. That means NASA must be strategic and cost-effective in every decision it makes. But to be honest, as Sean Duffy pointed out, the current Artemis system is simply too complex to be sustainable in the long run. The program relies on two completely different transportation systems, the Space Launch System and Orion spacecraft from the first, while SpaceX's Starship comprises the second. Integrating two vastly different systems adds significant complexity and drives up costs. The hardware for Artemis 2 II and 3, specifically the SLS and Orion components, is either completed or nearly finished. The European Space Agency has already delivered the European service modules for Orion for both missions. If the US were to cancel or delay these flights, it would risk damaging NASA's reputation as a reliable international partner. Flying these missions is essential not only for credibility, but also to ensure that American astronauts return to the lunar surface before China does. However, the Orion spacecraft is not as capable as it should be. Its crew module and launch abort system are heavier than modern, more efficient designs. The propulsion system in its European service module is underpowered. Furthermore, Orion splashes down in the ocean, which increases recovery costs compared to land-based alternatives. There's also a dramatic difference in operating costs between SLS Orion and Starship. As Duffy noted, a report from the NASA Inspector General estimated that each SLS launch will cost at least $4.2 billion for the first four Artemis missions. Adding in the Orion spacecraft raises that to around $5.2 billion per launch. By contrast, Elon Musk has said Starship launches could eventually cost as little as $10 million, or even $2 to $3 million in the long term. While the final commercial price SpaceX will charge is unknown, a reasonable estimate is about $40 million per launch. That means NASA could theoretically get 130 Starship launches for the cost of a single SLS-Orion mission. Starship is also more powerful, fully reusable, and capable of delivering significantly heavier payloads than SLS. It can fly more frequently and can land directly on the Moon or Mars, capabilities SLS and Orion lack. Each Artemis mission may require a dozen or more Starship launches to refuel in orbit, which adds cost, but this complexity was already baked into the original plan. If only we could use a single launch system for the entire mission. I mean, Apollo did it, right? Well, before the Artemis program was developed, SpaceX had a proposal to do exactly that. Use Starship to transport astronauts from Earth's surface to the lunar surface and back, all with one vehicle. 
Elon Musk unveiled this plan at the International Astronautical Congress in 2017. Notably, it did not rely on NASA's Space Launch System or the Orion spacecraft. It was a fully independent concept, based entirely on what is now known as Starship. SpaceX's original plan envisioned landing either 100 people or 100 tons of cargo on the moon, far exceeding NASA's requirements for Artemis. It was also significantly simpler than NASA's current approach. Only one crewed vehicle would be used, eliminating the need for complex orbital rendezvous and docking maneuvers in lunar orbit. In this concept, the crewed Starship would be refueled in an elliptical Earth orbit, then fly directly to the moon, land on the surface, and later return the astronauts safely to Earth. The vehicle would re-enter the atmosphere using heat shielding and aerodynamic flaps, and land vertically back on Earth. This version of Starship was designed for full end-to-end -end lunar missions, including re-entry and landing. This is very different from the Starship human landing system version NASA selected for the Artemis program. The HLS variant is based on the current Starship being tested in Earth orbit, but with major differences. Since it will never return to Earth, it won't be equipped with heat shielding or aerodynamic control surfaces. Instead, it will feature five solar panels that deploy from the midsection and a special white thermal coating to prevent sunlight from heating the cryogenic propellants. Starship has already demonstrated its ability to return from orbit and perform a pinpoint soft landing in the ocean, while re-entry from the moon generates significantly more heat than re-entry from low Earth orbit, SpaceX has been designing Starship's heat shield with returns from both the moon and Mars in mind. Laboratory testing has confirmed that the thermal protection system, TPS tiles, used on Starship can withstand the extreme temperatures associated with lunar re-entry. One major advantage of returning Starship directly to Earth from the Moon is the ability to easily maintain, refurbish, and reuse the vehicle. Once back on Earth, Starship can undergo thorough inspections and repairs using existing infrastructure, then be relaunched for another mission. This stands in stark contrast to maintaining and reusing a Starship variant that only operates between lunar orbit and the lunar surface. Maintenance in deep space would be a logistical nightmare. Critical systems require frequent inspection, parts often need replacement, and in some cases, entire engines must be swapped out. We currently lack the infrastructure in lunar orbit or on the moon to perform such complex maintenance tasks, and likely will for the foreseeable future. The concept of using a single starship for the entire journey to the moon and back is likely still years away from becoming reality. One of the key reasons is safety. The SLS and Orion system includes a proven launch abort system with a dedicated motor that can pull the crew capsule away from the rocket in the event of a failure. Starship, by contrast, does not have a traditional launch abort system. While it may offer some level of abort capability, it won't be nearly as robust as that of SLS and Orion. To compensate for this, Starship would need to demonstrate extremely high reliability. NASA might even require as many as 100 consecutive successful launches before permitting astronauts to fly aboard it. That's a high bar, but given the potential, it may be worth the wait. The benefits of having a single, fully reusable system capable of transporting astronauts to the moon and back are simply too significant to ignore. If Starship proves itself, it could revolutionize lunar exploration by making it far more cost-effective, frequent, and sustainable.